All right, I want you to get your Bibles out today, and, and I, I want to just, I want to encourage you in something. I know we've got electronic, and we try to do a lot of stuff electronically here at, at Cornerstone because it is effective and it's efficient in so many ways from our giving to our uh, registration for events and, and all of that, and it really, does, it really does help us. So I want to say thank you in doing that. I know some, oh, I'm old school. I don't like to do that. Well, come on, quit being old school and graduate from old school. And come on to new school. Can I get an amen? You do everything else on your phone. You do everything else on that. Help us in that. But here's something I really want to encourage you. Get your Bible and bring it to church. Because here's something I'm kind of concerned about. It has nothing to do with my message today. But I'm concerned that we're getting away from the word of God. I mean, we've got, and I understand, well, I can read the Bible right there. You can read it there, but there's something about when you've got the Bible in front of you and you have the printed word and you're able to digest this and go back. Because when I thumb through a screen, I'm just going to thumb through a screen and I may not go back to that screen. But I find that in my Bible, as marked up as it is and tore up as it was and had to get a new cover for it and that, I've got notes in there and underlines and things, and boy, it just really comes alive to me. So I, I want to encourage you in that. I want to encourage you, get your Bible, bring it to church with you, open it up, read Scripture along, and I think that will help you develop the habit that prayerfully, hopefully every day, you're turning to the Word of God. And you're finding something in that and you're, you're, you're writing about what God is doing in your life. But I, I want to encourage you in that. Can I get an amen? Yes. All right. I think I got everything taken care of I need to take care of. So let me just launch into this today. We are literally less than two weeks from the outpouring conference. And we've been praying and believing, and I preached on it a few weeks ago to get us ready for, for outpouring. But I want to kind of come down the stretch because I've got this Sunday and next Sunday to really begin to prepare your spirit for what I believe that God is going to do. This isn't just going to be another set of services. I mean, my goodness, we've had some of the greatest speakers last week, Bill Wilson. Was that not amazing to have Bill Wilson last week? And then we can just go down the list of those. So it's not about a special speaker. And we've got, as I said, some of the greatest speakers that are lined up, anointed men of God. I really is believe that it's about what God's going to do through them and what God's going to do in us. And from that, how that's going to launch into this city to begin something and set something into motion that I believe is going to have an impact, not merely upon your life, your family's life, but also upon this city and upon this valley because we're going to have pastors there to come in from all over this valley. But I want to talk to you this morning about the resurrection of an army. I really believe that God wants to raise up an army of believers. Can I get an amen? amen? So I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. I want you to turn there. It's a familiar story about a miracle that God worked, of resurrection power that raised up an army. Ezekiel chapter 37. Give you just a moment to get there. And let me begin reading in verse number one. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse number one. The hand of the Lord was on me. This is Elijah. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Everybody say very dry. That wasn't everybody. Everybody say very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will breathe, I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. 
Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word that is more powerful than a two-edged sword that divides asunder between the soul and the spirit. God, speak to us today. And just as you breathe life into that valley of dry bones, breathe life into us today, God. May we leave out of this place a vast army for your kingdom, God, to see the gates of hell push back in this city and in this valley and in this state. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Revival was needed. Here, here he said it was a valley that was full of dry bones. Our nation was once very strong morally, but I think there's no way to deny that we are seeing moral decay everywhere that around us. Uh, our nation lies as a valley of bleached bones. We need revival. Can I get an amen? The church, we, we sadly, we've got a lot of churches, but a lot of the churches are just like this valley of dry bones. They're, they're divided like bones, split up, broken apart. They're uninvolved. They're just laying out there, and they are dry. They are very dry. We need revival. So with that type of a scenario where here God takes the prophet and places it into that, what did God do? Well, here's what he did to change all this about. He called a man. God is always looking for somebody. God is looking for somebody to use. And many times we think it's somebody else. Turn to somebody and say, no, it's you. Just point out, just be the finger of God right now and say, no, it's you. God is looking for you. God is looking for me. Because as long as we push it off on somebody else, the job is never going to get done. So he looked for a man. Now, what were, what were some of the qualities of that man that God used? Well, first of all, he was a man that was in touch with God. It says in verse number one that the hand of the Lord was upon me. The person that makes a difference in this world is the person that has a touch of God upon their life. Oh, I thought I'd get somebody to help me this morning. God give us people that will seek the face of God. God give us people that will allow the hand of the master to mold them and to change them into what he wants them to be. We need people that are touched by God that have the hand of God upon them. Oh, you can have education, that's wonderful. You can have all the talent, that's wonderful. You can have all the abilities, that's wonderful. But the thing that will change a life is the touch of the hand of God. And I don't care how smart you are, I don't care how talented you are, I don't care how much money you've got, you can have the touch of God upon your life. God wants to touch you. So we've got to be willing to allow that to happen. We must be willing to change under the hand of God. Because too many times we say, God, touch me, just don't change me. Wow. Oh, God, touch me. But, oh, wait, no, you, no, I don't want, no, wait a minute. No, 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 I like that. Leave that there. We need God to come down and touch us. And Ezekiel was a man that God was willing to use to say, I'm going to touch you. And when I touch you, you're not going to be where I started you out. Because he took him and put him in that valley. I want to tell you right now, God wants to supernaturally take you to where you've never been before. To let you see what you've never seen before. If you'll just let God touch you. Ezekiel had been in touch with God and God was in touch with him. It's like a light bulb. The thing that makes a light bulb shine is not the light bulb. It's the power source it's connected to. That's why I'm saying, oh, God, put your hand on us. Connect us to your power so that we may shine. Elijah was a man that was in touch with God. And second of all, he was in touch with man because look where he put him. He put him right in the middle of the valley. Oh, I like that. When I said that, I just almost wrote San Joaquin down there, San Joaquin Valley. God didn't take him to the high mountain and say, now let me show you what's down in the valley. Watch, he says, no, I'm going to take you right smack dab in the middle of it. I'm going to put you among the dry bones. I'm going to put you among them and you walk among them. Ezekiel was right in the middle of the tragedy of that valley. See, we can never remove ourselves from the hurting that is around us. 
Too many times we want to isolate ourselves from it and we want to analyze it. But friends, the way that you touch a hurting world is you've got to be willing to suffer with the hurting. You've got to be willing to take on the mind of Christ and be willing to go right smack dab in the middle of it. Jesus left heaven and came down and dwelt among us. He came to the hood. 25 years ago when God began to bless this church and began to grow and people said, oh no, you need to go north. That was 25 years ago when there wasn't nothing north. Said, you need to go north. You need to head that way. Buy some land up there. Develop. Have a great campus. I said, no, I'm sorry. I'm from Oklahoma, and we've learned to dance with the one who brung us. And we're right here in the inner part of this city because this is where the need is. This is where the devil is working. And we need a a saving, hallelujah, glory-filled, Holy Ghost church right in the middle because where sin abounds, grace does abound so much more. I want to put my church right next to the gate of hell. He put it right in the middle. Elijah was in touch with God. He was in touch with man, but he was also a man of faith. He was a man of faith. God asked him the question, can these bones live? Science said no. Religion said no. The critics said no. You can't build a church in downtown Fresno. No, you can't do that. You can't have revival in this day. Oh, no. Everybody's leaving the church. Everybody's forsaken. It can't happen. It can't happen. Well, let me just tell you right now, when everybody else says it can't be done, just remember, God has the last word. Oh, come on. Somebody help me right now. I said, God has the last word. Circumstances do not determine the outcome. Budgets do not determine the outcome. Doctors do not determine the outcome. People do not determine the outcome. God is the one that determines the outcome. And see, uh, Ezekiel knew who had the power. He, He knew where it was because what his answer was, he said, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone no in other words god if you say they can then they can oh somebody ought to help me right now in other words god it's all in your hands just remember when you can't god can you need to stop letting other people determine your destiny you need to quit letting other people tell you what you can and cannot do unless of course it's your mama and your daddy but we've allowed so many times people, oh, that can't happen, that can't happen, that'll never happen. And you look at the circuit and you look at the situation and you can't figure out, well, I don't know how it's going to happen. It ain't for me to make it happen. I need to turn to God and say, oh, sovereign Lord, almighty God, the owner of heaven and an earth, the creator of all the universe. I don't care what I am facing. I don't care what situation I'm going through. You have the ability to make it happen, whatever you say. Some of you are facing situations today and you need to turn around and say, wait a minute, God, you know. You're listening to what other people tell you. Can't happen. They'll never get saved. They'll never get healed. That'll never change. You're never going to get out of that. Okay, God, what do you say? God, you know. You know what's going to happen. He was in touch with God. He was in touch with man. He was a man of faith. But lastly, he was obedient. I don't expect you to run the aisles on this one because this is where we have the problem. He was obedient. Verse four, God says, prophesy to these bones. Verse seven, so I prophesied as I was commanded. See, our problem is we don't want anybody telling us what to do. So I prophesied as it was suggested to me. So I prophesied because I felt like it. So I prophesied because I didn't have anything else to do. So I prophesied because it was convenient and everybody else was. No, I prophesied because I was commanded to do it. He didn't make any excuses. He didn't say, but, but Lord, they won't receive me. Oh Lord, they're, they're, they're not my type. We have got to stop making excuses for why we're not doing what God has told us to do and we just need to do it. 
I know that stung a little bit when you said amen on that. But I'm going to say it one more time. We need to stop making excuses. We need to stop making excuses for why we're not doing. I know I need to. I, that's amazing. People come to me and say, well, Pastor, I, I know I need to be doing. Well, let's stop right there. I don't need to hear anymore. Well, Pastor, I know I should stop right there. Then why aren't you doing it? Come on, somebody help me right now. And we list all the excuses of this. And if you're not careful, you'll talk yourself out of what God is about to do in your life. If, if Ezekiel had talked himself out of this and given all this, Ezekiel never would have seen the miracle that he was about to see. And you are missing out on the miracle that God is wanting to do in and through your life to the valley of dry bones that is around you, to your family, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your coworkers, because you're not being obedient to what God tells you to do. Man, that's good preaching. I thought I was back there, but I'm not. That's just a blue sky. You got to put me on this screen so I can watch me preach and say amen to myself there. Can I tell you that obedience is the pathway to the blessing of God? Obedience is the pathway to the blessing of God. So with that in mind, but here's a key that you can't miss in this. Because the key here is not just that he obeyed and prophesied, but it was what he prophesied. Because this is not about your opinion. This is not about man's opinion. This is not about man's wisdom. It is about the power of the word of God. And as long as you're just speaking what you think and what you believe and what you feel and what you think, there's no power in that. I said there's no power in that. We've got to speak the word of God. We've got to declare what God's word declares because this is where the life is. This is where the power is. This is where the anointing is. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God says my word will not return void. It will not pass away. Oh, come on. Some of y'all getting mad at your problems. You're getting upset at your problems. Why don't you start declaring and prophesying to your problems? Why don't you start saying what God says about your problems? Why don't you start saying what God says about your finances? What God says about your marriages? What God says about your healing? Quit using your opinion and your feelings and your emotions and prophesy to it as God says, speak to the mountain and cast it into the sea. Elijah was in touch with God. He was in touch with the problem, the world around him, in touch with man. He was a man of faith, and he was obedient. So what was the result? Well, revival follows obedience. Revival follows obedience. And you can walk through the Bible, and you'll find every story where there was a mighty move of God, where there was a revival, where there was a victory. You'll find it was because they did what God told them to do. This ain't rocket science, folks. Some of us are trying to over-spiritualize it. Well, I just got to get the right frame of mind, the right emotion, hold my mouth just right, get the right person on the piano. We're, we're still trying to find that. If I can get everything just right and the atmosphere is just right and everything's going good, then God, no, 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 my friends. You just do what God told you to do and God will anoint his word and God watches over his word to perform it. God's just looking for somebody to obey him. So, so revival follows obedience. I'll show you how that, there was a noise. I want to see the movie of this. So there, Ezekiel gets up, and so I prophesied as I was commanded. And God told him, what, so he, he begins to declare that, and it says in verse 7, there was a noise. So for all my quiet church friends, you're not going to be comfortable in heaven. 
because heaven's going to be loud. God bless y'all. You don't believe it? Read the book of it. He said, I heard the sound of mighty rushing river. It sounded like a roar that was going on of all of heaven, thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands throughout the eons of time that were worshiping God. Revival will always bring noise. You don't believe that? Look to an upper room in Acts chapter 2. There came the sound of a mighty rushing wind and it filled the whole place. Oh God, give us the sound of revival. The sound of people crying out to you. The sound of prayer. The sound of worship. The sound of people calling to you. But let me very quickly, before I make all of the Baptists upset with me, Noise alone does not mean revival. Noise alone doesn't mean revival. But I'll be honest, I haven't seen revival without noise. There was a noise. Second of all, there was activity. It said there was a rattling. Things started moving around. Revival will be noisy. Revival will bring activity. Things began to move. Something was happening. The knee bone was connected to the leg bone and the leg. And I don't know the rest of it. Here he was walking around and he began to prophesy. And all of a sudden there's a sound. There's a rattling. This bone started connecting to that bone. And that bone started connecting to that bone. And no doubt over the time as the wind had swept in because these were dry bones. They had been there. And the, and the dirt had covered up some of those bones. Suddenly where there wasn't a bone, you'd see this bone start working its way up through the dirt. And another bone start working its way up to the bone. In other words, things that you did not know were there started becoming visible. Oh, you, you didn't even catch that one. That went right over your head. When revival starts happening and there's activity, you're going to discover things you never even knew were there. You're going to see things you never thought you would see before. When revival happens, when revival comes, people start moving that you never thought you would see move. I'm, I just get so blessed. Sometimes I wanted to stop and just turn around and watch y'all during worship. I don't mean to say to watch you, but here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing people that never move for God, never worship God, never were excited about the things of God. I've seen a new fire that has been ignited with them. I've seen them worshiping God. I've seen them, instead of coming late for church, they come early for church. Instead of not coming to a prayer meeting, they're coming early for a prayer meeting. They're looking to say, how can I get involved? How can I do that? Real revival will bring activity. People will start doing things that they've never done before, and They'll do it with the right attitude. Oh, I wish somebody would get happy with me right now. Instead of being old sad sack, oh, oh no, we gotta do that. I don't wanna do that. No, you got people that when the Spirit of God begins to move, there's a noise that wells up inside. And they say, oh, well, can we do this, Pastor? Can we get involved in that? How can we do that? What do you need help there? Oh, what, what time does it start? I'll be there 20. Can I come and set up some chairs? Can I get ready? Real revival will bring activity. Oh, I thank God for all that we've got indicators of what's happening of people that are calling about outpouring and people that are, are engaging and people that want to be well. But let me tell you the indicator that I'm looking at. I'm looking at that Sunday night prayer meeting and every night the crowds are growing. Every night more and more people are coming to cry out to God. There's an activity that's happening and that's where the revival comes. Not only was there noise, not only was there activity, but there was unity. The bones came together. When real revival comes, people start working together. Brother Cantankerous gets along with Sister Fussy. And if you know who Brother Cantankerous is, don't look at him right now. Sister Fussy. Friends, the devil will do everything he can to keep us from coming together. You ever notice that when revival begins to move and the sound begins to happen, the activity is in the air, that the enemy will do everything he can to try to divide us? And every little problem will begin to service. Ah, they don't like you and they're doing that and he's doing that and she's doing that. Pastor don't like this and he don't like that and I don't like this and all that kind of stuff. Let me just tell you in the name of Jesus, shut your mouth. Hey. 
I'll I'll tell you what my old pastor used to tell me, and I say that with all respect. My pastor used to say when when I first started pastoring and I called him up, I said, you know, we got this problem, this this person, they're upset with this and this thing. I said, what do I do, pastor? And he said, you have church. Don't concentrate on them. You concentrate on a move of God. Because when there's a move of God that begins to happen, you watch and see if the noise of revival doesn't drown out the noise of the ill content. And suddenly people stop looking at that little bunch over there and they start looking at the bones that are coming together. They start seeing the army that's rising up and they say, I don't want that. I want some of that over there. And suddenly God begins to move when people begin to work together. Now, when things start coming together and people start working together, get me tell you, there's going to be friction. Because I'll just tell you right now, in the name of Jesus, some of y'all are hard to work with. I just, yes, amen, 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 amen. They're going to put this on my tombstone. The ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. That's what they're going to put on my ministry. Let me tell you what you do. When, they, when people start coming together and start working, and there's going to be friction. That's why, friends, we need the oil of the Holy Spirit. That's what the oil is there for. Because I tell you, when people work together, you're not perfect, I'm not pro- perfect. We're all a mess. But the thing that keeps us together, the thing that binds us together, the thing that keeps us working together is the oil of the Holy Spirit. It is the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. I found out when there's friction in my life, when I get full of the Holy Ghost, the friction doesn't affect me anymore. You can't change other people, but you can get yourself full of the oil. You can get yourself anointed, and it'll break down the friction. Elijah obeyed God and prophesied. But even with the noise, even with the shaking, even with the unity, there still wasn't life. There were bodies that were laying out there. Because, friends, you can have the noise, you can have the shaking, you can have the unity. But to have an army, you need something else. You can get things moving, pull them together, but there's still no life in them. And if you leave them in that state, they'll just go back to the way that they were. Because if life had not come into those bodies, what would happen? They would immediately start to decay again. They'd immediately start to break down again. And before long, we'd be right back to a valley full of dry bones. If you're going to see things change, if you're going to see things come to life, there has got to be something more powerful than just the form. There's got to be life that is in it. And that's why Ezekiel prophesied to the wind. Verse 9, he said, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into the slain that they may live. We need the wind of God. A wind of unity to blow away the dust of division. A wind of cooperation to blow away the cobwebs of complacency. A wind of power to blow away the dirt of moral moral decay. We need a wind of the Holy Spirit like they had in Acts chapter 2. That sound of a mighty wind. Oh God, one more time, fill this place. Because see, friends, we have everything we need. We've got people, we've got buildings, we've got programs, but by themselves, they will not bring life. We need the breath of God. We've got everything ready for this conference. Everything set for it to take place. Everything is in place, but it is not by might. It is not by power, but it is by the Spirit of God. There's a mighty army that God is ready to breathe into. We need the Spirit of God more than ever. And if we're going to be that army that's going to push back the gates of hell, it's going to take a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit within each one of our lives. Can I get an amen? So let me wind this thing now. Let me ask you, do you feel like, do you feel like a valley of dry bones? Do you, do you feel like you've gone through some stuff in your life that, that your life is scattered? Some of you do. Some of you say, Pastor, I just can't get my act together. 
I really feel like those bones that are out there, they're bleached by the heat of the day. Well, let me tell you right now, friends, if you've come in here that way, God is wanting to use you. God is wanting to speak to you and through you. All you've got to do is get in touch with him. Let God touch you today. You have to quit looking at the circumstances that are around you and look to the God that is above you. He's the author and he's the finisher of your faith. You're never going to see your life come together until you start obeying God. See, everybody wants the blessing of God. Everyone wants the power of God. Everybody wants the joy of God. Everybody wants the peace of God, but nobody wants to obey God. People want God to show up, people want God to show up at their house, but they're not willing to show up at his house. If, if you will be obedient to God and begin to declare the word of God over your life, God can bring that which was dead back to life. See, where the breath of God is, God breathes resurrection. Let me just give you one final thought, and I've got several final thoughts, but let me just give you one more final thought. That valley of dry bones that he went out and he looked at it and said, man, these are just scattered bones, dry, bleached out. Nothing can come of this. And maybe the devil said that about your life. Nothing can come out of your life. You've messed up so many times, you are a bunch of dry bones just scattered. But can I tell you, when he first went out there and looked at all over those bones, saw all that was happening there, what was taking place, the army was there all the time. The army was there all the time. It just needed the breath of God to bring it back to life. Friends, you've got the answer to bring victory into your life. You just need the word of God declared over your life and the breath of God breathed into your life. I'm telling you, there is resurrection power in this place today that you don't have to be dead and, uh, dead and scattered. You can be alive and moving as a mighty army. Now I want you to stand to your feet as I ain't through yet. Because I believe God is here today to resurrect somebody. I don't know if it's your marriage. I don't know if it's your relationship with God. I don't know what it is that scattered you. Your finances. I, I don't know. But it's a, it's a valley of dry bones that is out there. You need the resurrection power of God. And what I'm asking you to do is I want you to move. Dry bones, I want you to move. If you have a need in your life, maybe you're a day and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You're, you're dry and you know that. You know your relationship with God is not what it should be. Today's the day to let God speak into your life. I just keep thinking of marriages that, that you say, we look good on the outside, but on the inside, it's, it's not working. Maybe it's into your family with your kids and the devil just said they're never going to come back. They're never going to give their heart to God. In a marriage, family, addictions, whatever it is. You know what your valley of dry bones is. I want to prophesy over you today. I want to declare the word of God over you today. But before life came into that, those bones had to come together. Those bones had to start moving. Those bones had to attach and say, yes, I'm committed. And it wasn't until then that God said, now speak the word of God. God's promised me something about this morning. And I believe it's going to happen in your lives. Those of you that will be obedient to God. So I'm going to pray just very quickly because I think prayer is what focuses us. When I say amen and you say, Pastor, I want to be a part of that army. Pastor, I, I want to see 
life come into areas where there hadn't been life. I, I, I want to see the hand of God upon my life. I need a touch of God today. When I get through praying and say, man, if that's you, then I'll just ask you to step to the nearest aisle quickly because I've got one more thing I want to say. And come and stand here in the front. We'll crowd it as much as we can. Father, as Ezekiel prophesied to a valley of dry bones, I declare to these bones, live. I thank you in just a moment when I say amen. Bones are going to start coming together. People are going to start moving. Rattling is going to take place. There's going to be a movement, God, that is going to begin to put some things together in position for you to speak life into them at this altar. So, God, for those who want life, you have it for them. Thank you for people all over this auditorium. They're going to step out and say, I want to be a part of that army. And they're going to make their way to the front of this auditorium. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's you, come right now. Come right now. Come right now. I tell you what, folks, I wouldn't be clapping, I'd be coming. I wouldn't be clapping, I'd be coming. Because too many times we look at what God's going to do in somebody else's life, and God wants to raise up an army in your life. He's still here. He's still working. He's not done. He's not finished yet. Mm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting just a second. Have no fear. Because what I'm going to speak in just a moment, I'm not speaking to y'all. I'm going to speak to these. He's still working. He's not done. He's not finished yet. He's a never failing, never failing God. Obedience is the pathway to the blessing of God. Now, I want to read to you the end of the story. And primarily, I'm just talking to those of you that are down here. The rest of y'all can listen in and realize what you missed out on. Because at the end of the story, I didn't read it for you. I'm going to read it to you now. God explains to Ezekiel what has happened. He says in verse number 11, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up. In other words, we were once alive. But right now we're dried up. Friends, there is never, never anything wrong with you admitting your position in God. Because those of you that are honest before God to say, man, I'm, I'm dry. I need a touch of God. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness are the ones that are filled. It's those that act like they got their whole act together that will go dry. Give me people that are hungry for God. Give me people that are willing to say, I'm dry, I'm dry. David said, I'm dry in a dry and a weary land where there is no water. Oh God, I thirst for you. He said, their bones are dried up and our hope is gone. Some of you are in a situation say, there's no future for me. There's no hope for me in this situation. He said, and that we are cut off. That means we're isolated. You feel alone. You feel like nobody cares. You feel like nobody knows. You're dry. No hope. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. We're, I'm cut off. He says, therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people. My people, 
I don't care how dry you are. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how isolated you feel. I don't care how cut off you feel. If you have called upon the name of the Lord, you are his child. You're a child of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. God says, my people. He doesn't call you by dry bone. He doesn't call you by you can't do anything. He says, my people. My people, which are called by my name. He says, I'm going to open your graves. And this is what I prophesy over you. I'm going to open your graves. He, you got to roll away the stone. Some of you have been buried in your past and in your problems. You've allowed them to put you in that tomb and they've rolled the stone. But just like with Lazarus, I think Jesus is coming today and say, roll that stone away. I'm getting ready to put something back together. I'm getting ready to put life back into that situation. I'm going to open up your grave. Some of you have, have, have become satisfied in your sickness, satisfied in your sin, satisfied in the circumstances that are around you. I'm telling you today, it is time to let God open up those graves. Someone bring you up from them. That's resurrection power. Just like he said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. I'm telling you today, God's going to call your name out. God's going to call your situation out. God's going to call you by name. And God's going to say, all right, I'm opening up the grave. And I'm telling you, you need to come out of that. You need to come to where I want you. You need to come to what I've got for you there. You need to come out of that. He says, I will bring you back. God is ready to restore to you what the enemy has stolen from you. God is ready to bring you back to what you was before and even greater things. Oh, come on. Somebody help me right now.